Namaste, good afternoon. I'm Tony Cho, and I'm blessed and honored to be here in Dharamsala, India with these three venerable, beautiful human beings. <laughs> I'm compassionate warriors. Namaste. 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 I'm here with doc Dr. Robert Thurman, Priya Darshi, David Kate, Professor Kate from Columbia University. And we have gathered an incredible group of people that were calling the Upaya Collective. And we've all traveled from all corners of the earth to be here to visit His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the Nobel Peace Laureate, one of the most inspiring humans in the world that's inspiring compassion and compassion teachings around the world. And I'm with three of potentially the most um, knowledgeable people in the space around Tibetan Buddhism and the teachings of the Dalai Lama. So thank you gentlemen for being here. Um, maybe you guys could tell me what was the genesis of this trip? How did it come together? Uh, well, um, the Dalai Lama has reached the age of 87. He has traveled for 40 plus years to the West and all over the world, which is inspiring leaders and people to, to uh, be kind. He, he has, his slogan has been, my religion is kindness. He has very, very purposefully restrained from converting or trying to convert anybody to Buddhism. And he has told like the pope, three popes and various other religious leaders that it's too late in history to go around competing for market share in religions. And that we should all find the truth in each other and make world peace. And that's been his thing. So now he is less able because of his age, although he's very, very healthy. But he, the Tibetan people wish him to stay a long time to be their uh, protector and, and their cherished uh, leader. And so he, uh, he won't be able to travel like that. So there is a movement afoot by us and many others to try to enact his wishes of a more compassionate, kinder, more nonviolent and peaceful world society past the age of, of extreme nationalism and wars and et cetera, all this kind of thing, and oppression. And, uh, and also to deal with the climate issue. And so there's a movement afoot, and we are just part of that movement, are part of that movement, trying to, um, uh, upaya means art of, of enacting compassion. And that's what we're trying to do. The art of acting compassion, helping others to achieve enlightenment. That's right, and enlightenment mean, enlightened mean happiness, freedom from suffering, you know, not just some bulb in your head, you know, right. <laughs> a happy life, you know, so people can have a good life on this beautiful planet. Thank you. And David, how did this come together? How did the Upaya Collective come together? How is this, well, how did this manifest? Well, some of it, well, first of all, everyone has been ignited by the Dalai Lama's enthusiasm, vision, and by Bob's yes, incredible yes, so. optimism and, and, the defeatism that and energy, gets us. Which, is yeah, so, which is so necessary in today's times when we're all facing a real problem mm -hmm. here. So. This came together, you know, the, the notion of Upaya Collective, the name came from Gandon Thurman, Bob's son. Oh, yeah, he's the current who, CEO who of runs, Tibet House USA. Who runs Europe. Tibet House USA. And then many mm -hmm. of these amazing people were brought into this group by my son, Bear Kate. My brother, Jamba Vanjaya. <laughs> yes, and we're of course blessed here with Venerable Priyadarshi, who is just a font of wisdom of all kinds and an extremely chill guy. <laughs> and so this came together very quickly. Um, we were going to, we were contemplating it, and then we were told, oh, it would take too long to plan. And then Ludwig Kuttner on our board said, you know what? I'm going to make a challenge grant of a million dollars, and let's go see the Dalai Lama. And all of a sudden, everything was ignited. It all came together. Here we are. And the people who are here are really a collective of so many incredible geniuses. And so what we're trying to do is come up with both specific things and a general theme to realize His Holiness's idea of nothing less than a revolution, because that's really what we need, a revolution of the heart taking place in every being from top down, bottom up, and every place in between. So beautiful, a revolution from within. 
Priya Darshi, so tell us a little bit about how you got to this point and, and your journey a little bit in this journey here to Dharamsala with these beautiful men. Well, uh, I have a long-standing relationship with Bob Lerner, and then I met David as a fellow board member of Tibet House. And uh, as Bob Lerner mentioned, you know, we are in a state of uh, like an inflection point uh, with His Holiness turning 87. And we are beginning to see that perhaps um, there's an opening after the pandemic and you know, the world in its current state, that uh, there is something that the Tibetan culture and the Buddhist wisdom um, can, uh, can offer to the world. And, uh, but it needs to be told in a new way. It needs to be experienced in a new way. A new narrative. A new narrative, a new platform for that narrative. Right. Um, and so that's why we were able to uh, bring together this delightful, eclectic group of entrepreneurs uh, uh, young individuals who are exploring spiritual questions, but at the same time, all uh, united by their common love for this planet and common love for humanity. Uh, and here we are in Dharamshala, uh, exchanging ideas, uh, joyfully, delightfully, trying to figure out what the next steps should be. And so we will be having an audience with His Holiness after this confab of collective co-creation of what is the next way and the next platform leveraging technology perhaps web3 perhaps new modes of expression within the world to bring this consciousness this compassion you know this revolution from within to the world to heal the place that we're in which is a very troubled world that we find ourselves what are some of the topics that you think that we'll be speaking with his holiness uh, when we meet with him on friday what would you like to gain out of this I think, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll hear from both uh, Bob and David. I think, uh, you know, His Holiness is just an ocean of wisdom. That's what he is, you see. <laughs> uh, so there are two, I think, major things. One is simply to bathe in his presence. Uh -huh. Yes. You know, it's, a, it's, it's sort of this uh, continuation of this old idea of darshan, just mm -hmm. to be uh, in his presence. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, uh, to just hear his wisdom as to what and how he believes his message, uh, his methods, uh, his vision for humanity uh, will continue to inspire us and how we can help manifest it. Uh, that's what Tibet House is. Uh, Bobla, uh, yes, yes, what yes. is Tibet House? Well, His Holiness, when he first came to the States in 79, he asked me and uh, the late uh, Mrs. Dominic de Manil in Houston, Texas, uh, to work on, actually my ex-mother-in-law, uh, to work on uh, developing a culture center for Tibet. And the model of that is there is a Tibet house in New Delhi that's sort of like a cultural embassy that represents the existence of the Tibetan people with a distinctive culture and language and etc. against uh, the world's uh, misinformed opinion that Tibetans don't really exist, that they're just a kind of uh, province of China, which they really never were until they were invaded in the 1950s and 60s. And um, so uh, he asked for this cultural center. And then in around, the, uh, around the, in 86, uh, Richard Gere joined with us, which always asked him to. And Richard Gere, whose interest is more political uh, activism, but he joined the cultural activism thing for a few years and helped us a lot get started. And um, we have been presenting Tibetan art and Tibetan knowledge and very much Tibetan mental science. You know, and, his, and this has gone along with a process where His Holiness has met with materialists, what, what the Indian, in ancient Indian science, they would call outer sciences, that is the materialist, you know, biology, physics, and this kind of thing. And His Holiness and the Tibetan tradition has preserved and refined and developed the Indian mind science tradition, you know, how to change the heart, how to change the psyche, how to cultivate compassion and wisdom and so on. And so we've been working on that translating the great books that came from India that were that contained the sort of thousand years of progress made by the great Indian masters, Indian Buddhist masters, and then the another thousand years of the Tibetan masters developing that further, bringing that back out into the world from the Tibetan treasury of that, that sort of thing. 
So, um, and then in the future, when the Chinese decide to finally recognize that Tibetan culture and the Tibetan people are a kind of jewel that really belongs to the whole world, just like the high plateau source of all Asia's rivers is really, it should be an open park for the whole world, not to be spoiled in any way. And, and that was the Dalai Lama's dream. One of his dreams was to make Tibet one of the biggest parks in the world. Yeah, yeah, so the parks. Switzerland of Asia. Right. He, his race right. is the one with dream. Which is and a it, metaphor of what needs to happen around the world to protect that's right. the wild biodiversity that's right. that we're now losing. That's right. And so China, and China was a very strongly Buddhist country. They also had Taoism and Confucianism, but they were a very strong Buddhist country for 2,000 years until the communist times. And um, after that, they did kind of chewed up in imperialisms of various mm -hmm. kinds. They could they turn to communism, which is really a Western religion, you right. know? And, uh, and because of their love of Buddhism, the emperors of China would always keep Tibet on the crowns of their head and support them and, and, and would seek their prayers and seek their good vibes, you know? And, and their, their intervention with the weather deities to keep the rivers flowing and the prosperity growing in their, on their land. And now these guys, the communist guys, don't sort of get that, but they will. We're confident that they will with the Chinese. People have a very strong spiritual element in them, like every other human being. And we have no doubt, it's just, it's been a very long time for as well as 70 years waiting for the leadership to catch up with the hearts of their own people, in fact, you know. Right. And uh, we're confident that will happen. And at that point, the role of Tibet House will be the kind of foundation to help fund the reconstruction of so much of Tibet's own cultural treasure. In no way is it, of course, that we, can we go back to a pre-modern pre sort of like complete turmoil that Tibet has happened to Tibet in the last 50, 70 years, but a version 2.0, a Tibetan culture 2.0, right. right. interactive with the modern world, right. and with Tibet being a kind of sanatorium, healing center, and peace center for all the big countries and the big nations of Asia. Mm. That's the dream, and that we're sure that that will be realized, and we feel that that will be realized within the lifetime of the present Dalai Lama. So we have it's our own kind of singularity. We have to, he's promised to live another 23 years, which brings us to the singularity of 2045, but there'll be a spiritual singularity, which will be the, the liberation of Tibet and the offering of Tibet as a jewel to the, whole, to, to, the, to the healing use of the whole world, and hopefully in parallel with all other oppressed people in every part of the world. You know, the, the change of the world system where each individual local culture is allowed and encouraged to support the ecology of their local areas underneath a kind of peaceful, non-violent, non-militarized world government, taking all the military budgets of all the nations and putting them into reconstructing and regenerating life on this planet. We're sure that that will happen. And we feel that Dalai Lama's inspiration and refusal to admit defeat for the human race and for the, all the animals as well on the planet, we feel that that will prevail. Amen. Well said. <laughs> Bravo. So uh, the 2045 goal to, you know, save the planet, save humanity, save consciousness uh, in the lifetime of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. You know, there is a question. He is getting older. Who is going to be his successor? Will it be a man? Will it be a woman? Will it be the collective? The great teacher Thich Nhat Hanh from, from oh, yes. Vietnam said the next leader will be the collective. Yeah, he said he will we're, reincarnate as the collective. And he will reincarnate as the collective. Yeah. And, so, and by the way, we're not putting down, we're, we're welcoming at this moment Ray Kurzweil and Google's singularity where everyone will be <laughs> micro, micro robot, you know, nano, a nano level robot, you know. So right. some people who want to stay in their present embodiments, they can be reinforced by nano robot, nanobots, yeah. which is his vision of the singularity of 2045. And we're not scared of the Terminator, yeah. Terminator yeah. series 10, we don't care. Right. We're sure that they're gonna be nice because the people who are gonna program them are gonna be nice, so they'll be fine. So we, well, in a way, though, this, our pilgrimage here is a microcosm of what's happening because what's happening also, and His Holiness has talked about this, is the future is for the youth, right? And mm, women yes. are very important to all of us, <laughs> yes. although we sit here as poor men. But one, there are many people all over the world who are doing amazing things right now. And one of our visions for Tibet House going forward 
is to support all of those. And because we have the great good fortune of being exposed to Tibetan wisdom, which emphasizes the connection and causation of everything that's happening mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. we would like to help in whatever way we can coordinate the efforts of so many people who are doing all these wonderful things. And somehow to kindle a new spirit, keep mm -hmm. coming back to a revolutionary spirit, because the time is really now. And so with mm -hmm. Tibet House, as with the entire world, it's going to the youth, right? So we're, we're, we're not getting any younger, although Venerable Tenzin is a, <laughs> is a young man. But you, it should go to the youth. It should go to women and men, of course. But let's work together. Let's have harmony. Let's find something that will really trigger the hearts of people to be open. You know, every day there are hundreds of thousands of bodhisattvas doing good acts for each other. They don't get much publicity, okay, because we just hear kind of negative news cycle, which is driven in part by capitalist mentality, get people to tune in and buy things. Let's get over that. Let's wake up. And this is what His Holiness has been telling us, and it's up to us to figure out how to do that now. And that's collective. That involves the many, Upaya many collective. young people, mm -hmm. the Upaya Collective. But also, I can't help but notice that who gets killed in the wars? Mostly the young people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who knows really how to program about artificial intelligence? Young people. Who are the ones operating the drones that go and kill people? Young people killing each other. So we say, young people, let's wake up and somehow let's go to the next level instead of this parochialism, egoism, tribalism, even nationalism. Let's go to humanism, mm -hmm. all of us together. Here's the humanism 2045. Bob, I would, I would be honored and appreciate it. My community back at home, uh, my satsang, Kashi Ashram, Neem Kroli Baba, oh, Kashi yes. Ashram, yes. who I know that you have a relationship I with. Yes, I do. And you were a pendant of, of Neem Kroli Baba, and I would be so grateful if you would offer a message to the community and the Swamis and, and Kashi. Sure. And my grandmother, Ma. Well, you know, the fourth aim in life, His Holiness has four life aims uh, as a human being for transformative values, which the venerable Piyadarshi is representing at, of all places, MIT. He has Master's Institute of Technology. He has the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values. So that's his first aim in life, and, and the venerable Piyadarshi is, uh, is enacting that, has been for years in many countries around the world, compassionate leadership, wonderfully. Second one, as a Buddhist monk, better understanding between world religions so that there's no longer this competition for market share, conflict feeling that only their religion is the way, but able to share with others the good things in each one of their religions, and he affirms all of that. And third one is as a Tibetan to try to get a fair shake and a freedom for his people in whatever way, but within whatever federation and whatever thing is fine. He's not, he's called for nonviolent freedom movement rather than a violent one. And the fourth aim, though, is since he says that his body, he's lived longer in India than he lived in Tibet, and his body is more made of rice and dal than it is of momo, and he feels he has a debt to India, and he, he and the Tibetan culture are the son of the great Buddhist universities of India, Nalanda, and Vikramashila, and Ratnagiri, many of them, and hundreds of them. And he wants to bring a knowledge that was lost about 800 years ago in India, on the Buddhist side of the sort of Buddhist-Hindu dialogue that went on for 1,700 years from Buddha's time. And he wants to bring that back, not as Buddhism, he's not trying to convert a single Hindu to Buddhism, but as Indian inner science. Mm -hmm. And the knowledge, of the, the knowledge from which yoga came and which all the mental, wonderful mental, mental things that came that are the heart of Indian culture. And so in that light, you know, I see in, in the effort of enacting His Holiness's fourth aim, I feel it's important that Buddhists realize that Maharaji was a Buddha, meaning a perfectly enlightened per person, 
but he was manifesting within the, within the Hindu cultural context. Particularly, we love Hanuman, and he was a big devotee of Hanuman as too. And, and I have right here on my heart, I have a T-shirt that has Jai Hanuman on it, Jai which Hanuman. is what I learned from them. <laughs> and it, actually, the Tibetans and, and KD, who is my brother, my heart brother, Krishna Das, Krishna Das, he is so excited because Hanuman, the Tibetans have a legend that their whole the Tibetan race, a mythical origin of the Tibetan race, was a saintly monkey, a monk monkey actually, but he abandoned his, resigned his monkhood because a rock goddess, or like a kind of demon that fell in love with him up in the Himalayas when he was meditating. <laughs> and that's where the Tibetan beings people came from. And second, Hanuman himself is defends Shambhala at the time of Shambhala. Hanuman becomes a key defender of the sort of enlightened way of life that is a planetary one. It's not Buddhist, it's planetary and has to do with the wheel of time prophecy and all sorts of things like that. So, Nim Karoli Baba was a total Buddha. He, he helped uh, Richard Alpert become Saint Ramdas, with the late Saint Ramdas. He inspires KD and all the Bhaktiwalas, and, we, and the Tibetans will uh, then to learn about him, and we, we are very interconnected with that. So thank you everyone who keeps the flame burning of Maharaji, and um, we all join with that as well. You know? and, uh, and that's part of His Holiness's fourth aim in life to really give more self-confidence to the Hindu tradition to stand up against modern science with their own mental science, you know. The meaning from India of the inner science with the Western outer science then could create a truly healthy life for people and a happy and healthy life for people on the planet. Amen. Incredible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank it's very you. beautiful.